Hello everyone. Thank you for attending today's watershed webinar, Acid Mine Drainage. Our presenter is Dr. Travis Tasker, Assistant Professor of Environmental Engineering at St. Francis University. So yeah, my name is Travis Tasker. I'm one of the faculty members in environmental engineering here at St. Francis University. Uh, so I've been here for about four years. I did my PhD at Penn State University. Uh, a lot of my, P my PhD work was focused on looking at the environmental and human health impacts of oil and gas development. Uh, but since I've been at St. Francis, a lot of my research has been focused on acid mine drainage. And it's really interesting because what I'm learning is that acid mine drainage also is influencing phosphorus transport to the Chesapeake Bay. So that's what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. This is um, relatively new research that we've been working on, and I think it, it's really interesting, and I think it's going to um, potentially, this research could lead into being something that uh, lawmakers, regulators will really start to consider the fact that acid mine drainage itself could influence phosph phosphorus transport to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so this opening figure that I have, this is uh, acid mine drainage. It's at, actually in Johnstown. It's close to the incline plain. So you guys can see that this water, it's pretty orange. It also has a really low pH. So that, that orange color you see, it's actually iron oxides. So iron oxides will typically form in the bottom of streams that are impacted by acid mine drainage. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is the fact that these iron oxides that form are really good at absorbing phosphorus. And they actually kind of sequester phosphorus and keep it from moving downstream into the bay. Um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And I, I also want to let all of you know that I'm going to be asking some questions during this talk. So please feel free to unmute yourself, engage, participate um, with some of the questions that I ask. And then also, if you wanna stop me at any point during the presentation, please feel free to do so. All right, so the, the first thing I want to introduce you guys to is how acid mine drainage actually forms. And it forms from a reaction with water and oxygen reacting with pyrite. So pyrite is a mineral that is typically buried under the ground. And we commonly call this fool's gold. So we call it fool's gold because pyrite actually looks like gold. It kind of, um, very similar in how it appears, but actually it's very different chemically. So this bottom reaction that I have here, it shows FES2. So FES2, it's pyrite. That's the mineral pyrite, it's a solid. When it reacts with oxygen and water, it forms iron, uh, so iron two plus, and that dissolves in the water. And then it also produces sulfate and hydrogen ions. And for, for those of you who are aware of pH, um, so pH is a measure of acidity of the water, and that is related to H plus. So if you have a lot of H plus in the water, you generally have a really low pH or a lower pH. So this, this reaction with pyrite, it forms a low pH water because we have a lot of hydrogen ions. And then it also results in high iron concentrations that are dissolved in the water. Now, you in this reaction, you don't see aluminum anywhere. You don't see calcium. You don't see manganese. But these are other common pollutants or metal pollutants in landscapes that are impacted um, by mining or this reaction with pyrite. And you see aluminum, calcium, and other metals because this low pH water that forms, it actually dissolves other rocks that have aluminum or that have calcium. 
So typically you'll see also high concentrations of aluminum in areas where you have pyrite react, reacting with oxygen and water. Okay, so where does this pyrite come from? Well, in Pennsylvania, this reaction that you see typically happens from, from coal mining. So this pyrite is actually in a lot of coal seams. And so whenever we bring coal to the surface, it's now exposed to oxygen and water. And when water runs through that coal material that has pyrite in it, it creates acid mine drainage. So I, um, I put some common chem chemistry here for acid mine drainage that can form after this pyrite reacts with oxygen and water. And the, the pH of this water, it can be highly variable. It can range anywhere from a pH of 2.7 to 7.3. So a uh, pH of 2.7 would be really acidic water. A pH of like seven would be relatively normal pH for water. Iron concentrations can range from anywhere from 0 0.05 to 500 milligrams per liter. Aluminum can be anywhere from 0 0.7 to 108 milligrams per liter. And manganese can be anywhere from about 0 to 74 milligrams per liter. So those upper ranges of metals that you see in the water, that is, that's uh, really high concentrations. So just to give you a comparison, um, I also included the common water quality standards for good clean water. So good clean water should have a pH of around seven. Iron concentration should be less than 1.5 milligrams per liter. Aluminum should be less than 0.2 and manganese should be less than 0.2. So this, this table in the middle of this slide shows the common water chemistry for good clean water. And then this table on the bottom, I'm, I'm again just showing you the range of chemistry that can be seen in acid mine drink. So these upper ranges are much higher than what you would typically want to see in good clean water. Okay, so acid mine drainage itself, it impacts thousands of stream miles in Pennsylvania. So here's a map that shows Pennsylvania. The blue lines are just some of our more like major rivers or streams. The gray area is the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And then all of like the little orange areas you see, those are streams that are impacted by acid mine drainage. So we have streams um, in the Chesapeake Bay that are impacted by acid mine drainage. In total, there's been estimates that there are about um, anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 stream miles in Pennsylvania that are impacted by acid mine drainage. Okay, so this is a problem because acid mine drainage can de degrade both the water quality, um, but also like the aquatic life that's living in a stream. So I wanted to give you like a little case study example of this. Um, so this is the Catanning Run watershed. That's the map that I'm showing you. And for those of you who kind of live in the area, uh, Catanning Run flows into the famous Horseshoe Curve. Um, so if any of you have ever been to Horseshoe Curve or heard of Horseshoe Curve, um, sort of this, this famous railroad that is close to Altoona. And here uh, above Horseshoe Curve, we have it's called Catanning Run, and it's, a, it's about a three mile stretch of stream that is severely impacted by acid mine drainage. All of these orange dots you see, they are sources of acid mine drainage pollution into this stream. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna show you some pictures of what the stream looks like at various points along Catanning Run. So at this, this arrow, so you can kind of see um, this like third or fourth orange dot. Here's a picture of what it looks like. So there's actually a, like a, this really nice looking waterfall in Catanning Run, but it's an orange waterfall. <laughs> um, and it's orange because of the acid mine drainage that has been impacting this watershed. At this particular point in the watershed, the pH is about six. 
Iron concentrations are about 20 milligrams per liter. Aluminum is one milligram per liter and manganese is about 15 milligrams per liter. So if you remember, good clean water has about less than a milligram per liter of iron, aluminum, and manganese. So this water has pretty high metal concentrations. If we look farther down in this, this um, containing run, the pH decreases, decreases even more. So now it's dropped to 3.2 pH. Iron is 46 milligrams per liter. Aluminum is 13 now, and manganese is 25 milligrams per liter. Um, and also in the bottom of this stream, you can see that there's like this, this orange stream bottom, and that's because some of the iron has precipitated out on the stream bottom. So the water chemistry is bad, but also there is no aquatic life visible at any stretch along Catanning Run. And that's because the low pH is not favorable for fish to live. Um, and also the iron oxides that have accumulated on the bottom smother out any macroinvertebrates. So basically no macroinvertebrates or aquatic bugs can live in this water because of all the metals that are accumulated in the sediments. Um, so it has a pretty big recreational impact. It also has an impact in Altoona because normally this water would flow into this drinking water reservoir at Horseshoe Curve, but instead all of that water, it's diverted around the drinking water reservoir because the city of Altoona doesn't want to treat water that has 46 milligrams per liter of iron. It would make it very expensive. So it also kind of has a, um, uh, an economic cost too because this water cannot actually be treated um, by the Altoona Water Authority. All right, so this is where I want some, some uh, participation from you guys. So in addition to sort of this impact from AMD, we also have impacts from nutrient contamination in our waterways. And so I want you guys right now to to, to uh, let me know some of the sources of nutrient contamination in our waterways. Let's just see if you guys can name a couple. Um, so if you want to either write in the comments or unmute yourself, um, what are some sources of nutrient contamination in our waterways? Okay, agricultural runoff, fertilizer. Yep, so that's a good one. So actually I have that on the next slide. So sources of nutrient contamination yeah they can be fertilizers ag runoff and so here i've uh, shown <laughs> tried to show uh, visually what that might look like so maybe you have cows that are you know producing manure that manure can run off into a stream and then you can get nitrogen phosphorus getting in the stream you can also be applying fertilizers that can run off uh, sewage yes uh, that's a big one so that's actually what I have on the next slide. So wastewater treatment plants, they're also big contributors for nutrients. Um, I always find it interesting how a lot of people don't realize that the, the waste that you produce goes to a wastewater treatment plant. And so here's uh, just an aerial image of Altoona drinking, uh, Altoona wastewater treatment plant. So you're a lot of wastewater in Altoona goes here and the wastewater that is treated, it, it leaves through, you can see like this little green channel that I have drawn. Um, so the wastewater that's treated leaves and it goes back to the local stream. Um, so on this next slide, I, I wanna show you guys what like the common chemistry of your wastewater is. So you can get an idea of all the stuff that's in it. So it has, Pretty high total organic carbon, about 160 milligrams per liter, pH from seven to nine. Nitrogen concentrations are really high, about 35 milligrams per liter. Phosphorus is also really high, about 5.6 milligrams per liter. Also, your, your wastewater can have a lot of um, pathogens in it. So a way that we typically enumerate that is through what's called fecal coliforms. Can have anywhere from 10,000 to a million counts of fecal coliform per milliliter. And then there's also oil and grease. So this is sort of the raw chemistry that a wastewater treatment plant receives. But it's actually also really common for a wastewater treatment plant to not be able to remove 
nitrogen and phosphorus. So the, the wastewater, that treated wastewater that leaves and goes into a stream can still have 15 to 35 milligrams per liter of nitrogen and four to 10 milligrams per liter of phosphorus. So it can still have really high nutrients. As a, um, another example, um, your nutrients that maybe we see in a stream can also come from what are called wildcats. And wildcats is basically whenever you have like a pipe that goes from your toilet directly into a stream. And believe it or not, there's actually a lot of wildcats throughout Pennsylvania. It's just raw sewage that's being discharged to a stream. All right, so why does this matter? Well, it matters because um, a lot of research has shown that the desired nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations in our streams and lakes should be anywhere from about 0 0.1 to 2 milligrams per liter of nitrogen, and phosphorus should be about 0 0.01 to 0 0.075 milligrams per liter. And those concentrations are just sort of what are assumed to be uh, levels that will prevent eutrophication in our in our lakes. So this is this image to the right here. It shows the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So you can see Pennsylvania, Maryland, and the Susquehanna River flows down into the Chesapeake Bay. And sort of this orange color you see in the image, that might be just like suspended solids that are in the water that are making it to the Chesapeake Bay. But then in the Chesapeake Bay, you also see sort of like this green color. And that green color would be like eutrophication occurring. So algae, plants, all these things that are able to grow because we have a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus that are making it to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so just as a comparison, I, I again put the raw wastewater chemistry in the bottom table here. So you can compare it to sort of like the recommended nitrogen and phosphorus in our waterways. And you can see the nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations in our wastewater are much higher than what is recommended to be in our actual streams. Okay, so why does this matter? Um, well, it matters because in a lot of the areas where we have like wastewater treatment plant discharges into our streams, we also have acid mine drainage. So here's the map that I showed previously that showed like all the streams that are impacted by acid mine drainage. And I'm also showing you municipal wastewater treatment plants that are discharging the streams that are impaired by acid mine drainage. And you can see that there are many that are in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. All right, so this is really important. And the reason it's important is because our research shows that acid mine drainage can actually attenuate sources of nutrient pollution. Um, so in this slide, the orange region represents acid mine drainage chemistry. The, the green region on the outside right represents wastewater chemistry. And then in the middle, that shows the chemistry that we expect after those two waste streams sort of like mix together. Okay, so let's, let's break this slide down a little bit more. Um, so in the orange region, our acid mine drainage, you can see it has a lot of iron, maybe aluminum, calcium, and the pH is really low. Our wastewater, it has a lot of phosphate, a lot of nitrate, the pH is generally pretty high, and it has a lot of alkalinity. Whenever these two sources of pollution mix together in a stream, it actually results in um, a near like neutral pH, but also we start to see these solids that are forming. And some of the solids you might see form are like iron oxide, so FeOH3, that's a solid. That's the orange precipitate that you commonly see on the bottom of streams that are impacted by AMD. You can also see formation of aluminum oxides and this is typically more of like a white precipitate that you'll see on the bottom of streams impacted by AMD. Okay, but here's where it gets really interesting. So the iron oxides that form on the stream bottom, they can absorb phosphate. Uh, so 
a way to think about this is like maybe in some of your homes you have like an activated carbon filter and that activated carbon filter makes your water taste better and it makes your water taste better because it can absorb organics or odor forming compounds in your water well in the same way iron oxides can absorb phosphate and remove it from water and also so we can have like phosphate sorbing to iron oxides or aluminum oxides, but we can also get aluminum and iron and calcium phosphate minerals that form. So we could get calcium three phosphate that forms. This is also called called a uh, apatite. It's it's the same mineral that makes up your um, like your your uh, teeth. So your teeth are actually made out of apatite. It's calcium phosphate. Uh, you can also form aluminum phosphate or iron phosphate. So these are all minerals or surfaces that can absorb phosphate and remove it from water. Um, so here's just sort of a, a depiction of what might be happening in a stream. So maybe we have acid mine drainage that's flowing into a stream and maybe we also have phosphate that's flowing into a stream. Whenever these two things mix together, we can have reactions happening that maybe like aluminum and phosphate reacting, they form aluminum phosphate and that removes phosphate from the dissolved component of the water. All right, so I have a couple like case studies to demonstrate this. So this is some research that we've been working on. Some of it's been published. Some of this hasn't been published yet. But we, we asked the question in some of our research, like to what extent does acid mine drainage actually remove phosphate from our fresh waters. So we actually did this work, most of it um, more in Western Pennsylvania, not in the Chesapeake Bay, but it still applies to the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, so we looked at a couple different areas. Um, so if you look in the bottom left panel, we looked in a, a region where there was a stream that was impacted by acid mine drainage, but there was a wastewater treatment plant that discharged to that AMD impacted stream. And we're calling that treated wastewater or WW. We also looked in a residential area where there were known wildcats that were discharging to a stream impacted by AMD. And so we're calling that sewer. Uh, we also looked at an area where there's a lot of agricultural runoff into the stream uh, that was impacted by AMD. So I'm calling that agri. Uh, we also looked in a suburb where we suspected that there could have been some phosphate runoff into a stream that was impacted by AMD. And then we also had this neutral AMD site where we had a stream that was pretty severely impacted by AMD, but the AMD had a, like a near net neutral pH. So the pH was around seven and there was treated wastewater that went into the stream. Uh, so we're calling that the neutral site. So real quickly, I just wanted to show you some of the, the results from that work. Um, so on this top panel, the y-axis shows the percent removal of nitrate, which is in purple, and green is phosphate. And what you can see is that basically in the suburban and what we're calling the neutral site, there was like no phosphate that was removed. But that was also because at these sites, we also didn't really measure any phosphate coming out of um, the wastewater treatment plant or the suburban impacted area. But at the sewer site, at the agricultural impacted site, at the other wastewater treatment plant site, we saw pretty high phosphate concentrations going into these streams that were impacted by AMD. And in most cases, the AMD removed over 30% of the phosphate from the actual water. Um, so 30% is really significant, especially whenever you look at uh, a lot of like the Chesapeake Bay models that suggest um, over like the next 10 years, I believe, we're, we're trying to remove 20% of the phosphate load that's going to the Chesapeake Bay. Well, in this scenario, AMD removed over 30% phosphate. And I'll explain some of the implications for that later, but for now, I, I just want you to recognize that streams that are impacted by AMD do actually remove phosphate. Um, 
we did an additional study to try and figure out what actual like mechanisms were responsible for removing the phosphate. So we did this study at Galitzin and um, particularly Bradley Run. So this was in Galitzin, PA. And in Galitzin, they have a wastewater treatment plant that discharges into a stream in literally directly across from that wastewater discharge, there's also an acid mine drainage discharge that flows into the stream. And that's what this top figure is showing. And right where they mix, you see all of these reactions occurring because downstream, the stream, it's, there's all this aluminum precipitate on the bottom, it's very white. And there's also these um, iron oxides that are very visible on the bottom stream surface. Um, so we looked at this site in, in uh, pretty significant detail to try and figure out what was actually happening in terms of nutrient removal. Um, so I want you to direct your attention to the percent removal graph at the bottom. Uh, so the bottom right, and particularly just focus on the bars that say PO4. Um, so we're showing you PO4 removal at DS90, DS950, and DS1400. And those just show distances downstream from the mix site. So the mix site where the wastewater and the AMD mix together. So DS90 is 90 meters downstream, 950 meters downstream, and 1400 meters downstream. And basically we, we observed 100% removal of phosphate at all of the locations downstream. That's pretty significant. Um, this reaction that's happening is removing 100% of the phosphate. So we, we looked um, a little deeper into this to try and figure out what is explaining the phosphate removal. And I won't go into the details of the modeling efforts we, that we did, but that this panel on the right is showing our model results. And basically what our model results showed is that the phosphate attenuation that we were observing in that stream, it was controlled by absorption to iron oxides and aluminum oxides that were precipitated on the bottom of the stream. And we also saw evidence that some phosphate minerals like aluminum phosphate and calcium phosphate were also forming. So these mechanisms, absorption to iron oxides and precipitation of phosphate minerals or water is actually removing phosphate in these AMD impacted streams. All right, um, so I, I want to now put this into perspective of why this is important and some things that maybe we should um, be concerned about potentially um, moving forward. So, um, if you look at the bottom of the screen, I'm basically showing this iron oxide solid that could be absorbing phosphate in an AMD, AMD impacted stream. So the phosphate is absorbing to these iron oxides that might be on the bottom of an AMD impacted stream. Well, I also want you to be aware that that phosphate can also desorb back off of the iron oxide. Um, so similar to like maybe your activated carbon filter, there are chemical processes that could desorb contaminants back out of your activated carbon filter. Well, the same thing can happen in AMD impacted streams. The phosphate can desorb back off of the iron oxides. And one process that can drastically influence that is pH. So I want you to direct your attention to um, this figure in the middle, it shows pH on the x-axis, and then it also shows percent phosphate that is dissolved in the water. So zero would mean basically there's no phosphate in the water. 100% would mean um, all of the phosphate has been dissolved in the water or it's back in the water. Okay, so why is this important? Well, this model is showing you phosphate desorption from iron oxides with pH. So around pH six, you can see that basically based on our model, 
all of the iron oxide should be absorbing phosphate. So all of the phosphate would be absorbed to the iron oxide. But as the pH increases, more of that phosphate desorbs back off the, of the iron oxide. And this is just due to various um, equilibrium principles with chemistry. Uh, this is important because from the 1950s to the 2000s, the pH of water at the Conowingo Dam prior to the Chesapeake Bay was around pH 6. Um, currently at the Conowingo Dam, which is the last dam again prior to the Chesapeake Bay, now in 2021, the pH has been recorded to fluctuate from about pH 8 to 8.5. Okay, so this is really important because prior to 2000, most of our waterways in the Chesapeake Bay were acidic. And under those conditions, phosphate would be absorbing to iron oxides. And that, that process would remove a lot of phosphate from our, our waterways. But now, um, because of a lot of changes in our environment and whatnot, the pH has increased. And that increase in pH is making it less favorable for phosphate to absorb to iron oxides. Um, so actually, based on the chemistry observed between now and prior to the 2000s, about 50% of the phosphorus would be desorbing from the iron oxides. Okay, so I want, I want to ask you guys a question. Why, why has our surface water pH increased so drastically over the last 20 years in the Chesapeake Bay? Um, so I was wondering if you guys had any, any ideas why our surface water pH has increased so much. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we have started treating AMD. That is a good one, uh, that is true. So we've treated a lot more AMD. So that has increased the pH. Uh, temperature increase. Um, it, would, it would potentially influence the, the pH slightly. There, there is something bigger that has really influenced uh, increasing CO2, has a little bit of an influence. Limestone from passive treatment systems for treating AMD has a little bit of an influence. Um, does anyone know what we've done to a lot of our coal power plants or coal fire power plants? Okay, so this is, this is the big one. This is what's really influenced our surface water pH. So a lot of our coal-powered um, plants, coal-powered power plants, um, they, they've had to undergo like maybe more strict regulations that reduce their sulfur dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. So when coal-powered plants burn coal, they produce a lot of sulfur dioxide and that contributes to acid rain. Well, regulations have changed drastically over the last 20, 30 years and coal power plants are required to have scrubbers in them or maybe change their burning processes to reduce sulfur dioxide to the atmosphere. And I wanna show you guys what that has done to our pH of our acid rain. So this is a image that shows the pH of our rain in, in, the 19, in 1985. So if you look at Pennsylvania, the pH of our rain was four. That is incredibly low. Um, in, in the 2000s, you can kind of see that maybe the pH was increasing slightly in Pennsylvania, but then this, this is pretty drastic if you look in 2020. Um, so in 2020, you can see now that most of the, our rainwater pH, it's increased to above five. And that has had drastic influences on the pH of our surface waters. I mean, it's had good influences, but it's just important to note that these, these types of changes have influenced the pH also in our surface waters. Um, another one that was mentioned in the chat is 
treatment of acid mine drainage. So this is a large passive treatment system for treating AMD. Um, runs the AMD through limestone before it gets to the stream and it basically increases the pH. So the combination of treating acid mine drainage um, and also reducing acid rain is, is what has contributed to those big drastic changes in surface water pH. All right, so um, what does this really mean for the Chesapeake Bay? And um, one of the things that it means ultimately is that acid mine drainage plays a, a, an important role in reducing phosphorus to the Chesapeake Bay. I hope all of you are kind of convinced that after seeing some of the data that I showed you that in streams where there is acid mine drainage, it can sequester um, sometimes up to 100% of the phosphorus that's coming from these sources of phosphorus pollution. But it's also important to note that this type of process that I'm showing you in this diagram, this has been going on for, gosh, decades. Acid mine drainage has been absorbing a lot of phosphorus for decades. And the low pH that is, that is in our streams you know, prior to the 2000s, it's made like a really favorable environment for phosphate to absorb to those iron oxides. But I wanna go back to this figure that shows that now where our pH is higher in our surface waters, all of that phosphate that has been previously absorbed to these iron oxides could be desorbing back off of those iron oxides. And so while we're doing all of these BMPs and, and restoration projects and ag BMPs to try and reduce phosphorus to the Chesapeake Bay, the fact that our pH of our waterways is higher could also be resulting in conditions that are desorbing phosphorus back off of all of this legacy phosphorus that has been absorbed to iron oxides. So it's kind of an interesting feedback loop that could be happening. Um, despite our efforts to improve water quality through um, reducing acid rain, through uh, cleaning up acid mine drainage, through all these BMPs that we're putting in place, there could be sort of an interesting feedback where now we also don't have acid mine drainage that's sequestering phosphorus in our streams. So I wanna leave you with um, the key take home point, which is that acid mine drainage definitely has an influence on phosphate retention and transport to the Chesapeake Bay. And this must be considered in um, future models for phosphor phosphorus transport to the Chesapeake Bay. And it also must be incorporated into models that show, well, what is going to happen if we clean up all of the acid mine drainage? What additional phosphorus load is that going to put to the Chesapeake Bay if we no longer have AMD in our streams sequestering phosphorus? And here's just a fun picture of a stream in Somerset, Pennsylvania. And it shows basically an ag impacted stream that is mixing with acid mine drainage. And where the AMD mixes with the ag impacted stream, you can see all of those metals that are precipitating on the bottom of the stream. So the white you see, that's aluminum oxide. The really orange color you see, that's a form of iron oxide. And what I'm proposing is that those metals that are forming on the bottom of the stream are actually absorbing a lot of phosphorus. And that has implications for the Chesapeake Bay. All right, so there are many people that I wanna acknowledge for just contributions to some of the content that I showed you in this presentation. So Peter Smintek, he's a faculty member at St. Vincent College. William Strohsnyder, he's at the University of South Carolina. Um, Charles Cravada and Joe Duras, they're both with the USGS. CJ Spellman and Joe Goodwill, they're at the University of Rhode Island. James Eckenrode, he's one of our lab managers here at St. Francis University. I'm sure many of you on the call have met him. Julia Labar, um, she's at St. 
Centenary University, and then the Coolcom Foundation actually provided grant support for some of the, the results that I showed you. Uh, so with that, um, just gonna let you guys ask any questions that you might have and thanks for your attention. Well, while right. we're doing that, uh, I was gonna say, thank you very much for doing this. And did yeah. you mention that there was a, while they're thinking about it, um, and maybe we'll get some questions in here. Did you mention there was a resource or some kind of, um, do you have any suggestions if people want more information about acid mine drainage or learning about phosphorus going to the Chesapeake Bay, either one, um, do you have any suggestions for, for future, um, you know, um, ideas or? Yeah, this topics? is um, kind of a, a newer area of research, but we, we just actually published two papers on it. So maybe I'll share those with you, Michael. And if any of you on the call are interested in reading those papers, we can share them with you. Um, yeah, so I guess in terms of content, that's something that I could share with you, Michael, that you could share with the participants. All right, so yeah, I see a couple of questions in the chat. So how do you choose what streams to study? Um, that's kind of challenging because ultimately with some of these sites that we were studying, we were basically looking for a location where we knew acid mine drainage was in the stream and we knew that there was a form of nutrient pollution going to the stream. And once we identified those particular sites, we were able just to do some simple measurements in the stream to quantify how much of the phosphate was being sequestered by the AMD. And um, a lot of those sites that we have found for some of the, the data that I showed you were just through collaboration, um, word of mouth from conservation districts who knew where there was wildcats or uh, wastewater treatment plant, plant discharges going into A and B impacted streams. Uh, what is the best way forward? Um, so that's a, a good question. Um, I think ultimately we need to clean up acid mine drainage in our streams, but I would just like um, maybe regulators, people who are doing like the Chesapeake Bay models, I would just like to see um, to see acid mine drainage considered in those models and sort of the, the trade-off between how cleaning up acid mine drainage could actually put more phosphorus into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I think it's just important to be aware of that and to be aware that actually currently there's a lot of phosphorus that could be sequestered by AMD that we're not really observing in the Chesapeake Bay. Is it possible to collect the metals before they are able to release? Um, it'd probably be really hard to do that in uh, like a, a you know five thousands of stream miles that are impacted by AMD. Um, but a place where you could potentially do that is the Conowingo Dam. So maybe some of you are familiar with the Conowingo Dam. I mentioned it in this presentation, but it is the last dam before the, the Chesapeake Bay. And interestingly enough, that dam is full of sediment and they basically have reached their sediment holding capacity. I, I think there have been discussions about whether it should be dredged, but ultimately um, I would think that the, Ches the Conowingo Dam is holding a lot of metals, precipitates, from AMD impacted landscapes that were basically scoured out during large storm events and they ended up in the Conowingo Dam. So Conowingo Dam could be a place where, um, you know, you could pull some of those sediments out and potentially um, limit their ability to desorb back into the water column and go to the Chesapeake Bay. 
Um, interestingly enough that we actually had submitted a grant to look at that and how um, changes in pH over time could influence phosphorus desorption from sediments in the Conowingo Dam. Uh, was the dead zone big this season? Um, I actually didn't follow it this season. I'm not sure. Michael might have a better idea of that than me. I don't, but I think we looked that up. Uh, I think I had a map that I will look up and see if I can figure it out here. Um, and I will share that because I know that we were tracking that last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a uh, Barbie's comment there. It is an interesting point that if we do clean up this acid mine drainage, then it seems like we could be adding more phosphorus into the bay. And I think our research, like, certainly shows that that could be the case. Um, and we're we're not we're not suggesting that our research indicates that we shouldn't clean up acid mine drainage because we still think that it should be. I think we just need to be aware that as we clean up acid mine drainage, there will be less AMD that is sequestering phosphorus. And I think that should be accounted for in the Chesapeake Bay models. But yeah, these are good questions. So if anybody is interested, I'll put a link in the chat for what the uh, oxygen, some of the, um, current conditions in the bay are right now so if you're interested in checking that out uh, check out the link here in the uh, in the chat i think it brings it up to oxygen but then there's some other um mm -hmm. uh, factors there along the side does anybody else have questions so locally there are some acid mine drainage sites like right around Loretto in this area. To the east, there's not as much like as you get further to the closer to the bay. Um, does the would anything um, could anything besides like the dams influence like what's going on there? Uh, like, like is it a big um, is acid mine drainage a, a big factor in what's going on with the bay, given that we're kind of farther away? Um. So it still could be yes, because ultimately like what we do here, you know, even in Clearfield or even in Loretto can still influence the, the chemistry that's observed in the bay. Um, and this, I wish I had the numbers. I should have put them in the presentation, but Bradley Run, the site in Galitzin, um, we had actually calculated the phosphorus load or mass that was removed per year and I wish I could remember the number, but it was like thousands of uh, kilograms of phosphorus that were removed in a year. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's significant, even what we're observing here around Clearfield, you know, Loretto, um, does remove significant amounts of phosphorus, and that influences what is being observed in the Chesapeake Bay. But most of the AMD, um, that might be influencing the Chesapeake Bay. A lot of that is right around here where we live. Uh, more like the Clearfield area. There's a lot of AMD impacts still there. So then if um, the Conowingo Dam were to be dredged, what exactly do you do with that sediment? Do you put it somewhere where like you don't want it to run back off into the water? Does it need to go into like a landfill? Very expensive. Uh, I think basically um, discussions that I've heard, it's just almost not even an option because of how expensive dredging that would be. But yeah, the first step would be collecting sediment samples and you send your the sediment samples to a lab and they do what's called a T-clip analysis. It's a leaching analysis and basically reacts the sediment with common conditions that you would expect from like atmospheric deposition, like rainwater. And it looks at what can be leached back out of that sediment. And basically what's, depending on what's in that sediment influences how it can be disposed. 
So if it has little potential to be leached, there's probably locations where it can be buried or used as fill. If, if there are toxic things in it, then yeah, it has to be sent to a landfill. Do we know if other watersheds are experiencing this? Yeah, so probably the Ohio, Allegheny, um, probably the Ohio and Mississippi, they're experiencing it maybe even more than the Chesapeake Bay because most of the AMD in Pennsylvania um, and West Virginia and Ohio, that's flowing to the Mississippi. And unfortunately, like we haven't, like we've, we've done work um, in the Ohio, but it's harder to get grant dollars to, to do work there because everyone cares about the Chesapeake Bay, maybe not so much about the Mississippi. Um, so yeah, I think more of our work has been kind of geared towards the Chesapeake Bay, but the, the results we're getting for the Chesapeake Bay are directly relatable to the same thing what we're observing in the Gulf of Mexico, so. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, how do you suggest best demonstrate this impact to the students? Um, yeah, so I could I could think of some like fun lab experiments to do in a chemistry class to show this. Um, could probably also suggest some field sites where you could take your students and you could measure phosphate upstream and downstream of areas where you have AMD and a nutrient source coming together. Um, but if, if going to the field isn't possible, I, I can think of some really pretty cool experiments you could do in a chem class. Yeah, so maybe I can um, I can type up something, Michael, and share that with you, and maybe that's something you can give to the yeah to the to the teachers here. Absolutely, we can relay that information. Yeah, so just send me an email, Michael, to remind me to do that. Otherwise, I won't do it. But I can I'll definitely come up with something. And we actually have done experiments like this as part of one of our labs for engineering. And I could definitely just modify it a little bit for like high school students. Okay. So yeah, some things, some things you would need to do that though, and maybe be like a kit to measure phosphorus. Um, and so a kit to measure phosphorus, whether that's a Hawk kit or um, you can also use like a spec method if you have like a spectrophotometer in your in your chem lab, you could also use that to measure phosphorus. Awesome. Does anybody else have any questions before we wrap up here? Okay, so thank you again. If anybody has any other questions, feel free to shoot us an email, you can email my personal account, which is msal at francis.edu, or you can uh, do the science send, uh, science outreach at francis.edu, um, and I can relay your messages to uh, Travis. And with that, we will wrap things up, but I wanna thank our presenter again for coming and everybody for joining us, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Adios. <laughs>